शरीर जो और सबसे शरीर इस शरीर शैतान रजीम बिस्मिल्लाहिर्रहमानिर रहीम अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह रब्बिल आलमीन वस्सलात वस्सलाम अला रसूलिल करीम व अला आलिहि व सहबिहि व मन इस्तन्ना बि सुन्नति अल यौमिद्दीन अस्सलाम वलैकुम व रहमतुल्लाहि व बरकातहू uh welcome we're back brothers and sisters to session number 9 of our uh, series of half of your deen which is basically uh, an intensive deep dive into marriage and family life uh, in islam uh <clears throat> so we've looked uh, covered most of the sections there as you can see we looked at the introduction problem statement uh, we saw what islam talks about in terms of choosing of a wife and how to choose a husband yeah Uh, we we'll also look at um, whom we can marry, whom we can't marry in Islam. Uh, we also look at uh, wedding rights, how they are con- the contemporary wedding rights, as well as how they should actually be in Islam. We discussed that at length, Alhamdulillah. Um, and we also saw um, the women who are forbidden to marry in terms of uh, kinship, in terms of uh, reason, yeah, the the permanent forbiddens and also the temporary forbiddens, right? Uh, and yesterday uh, alhamdulillah we started talking about the section of uh, during marriage uh, we looked at um, the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wherein he says that if one has a righteous wife uh, a good practicing muslimah because remember we said the hadith talks about religious commitment right not just religion not just a muslimah but rather religious commitment so she should be a practicing muslimah steadfast on islam then actually it is a blessing from allah and that allah has helped the brother with half of his deen and let him fear allah with the other half right so this is what the brothers the shabab who are yet to marry should actually look out for in terms of uh, the bride or in terms of the wife to choose uh, we also said that these are from allah's signs in surah rum that he has chosen mates for us from amongst us ourselves so that we can have peace and tranquility in the home Uh, now i know many houses are uh, you know devoid of this but inshallah we will see how we can uh, rekindle rekindle that and bring back uh, the love between the hearts inshallah it is not impossible it is def- definitely feasible and definitely doable right uh, because allah has put love and mercy between the hearts already so it's it's for the husband and the wife to uh, discover that love and mercy through obeying the commands of allah and keeping away from his prohibitions even if we have missed the bus in the sense that you know we did know about this ahadith and we already married and maybe most of us are in this in this boat in the sense that you know um, we we um, uh, we didn't have that knowledge of the deen alhamdulillah now we have it so we've already got married uh, based on whatever we thought was right and our parents thought was right uh, but we still have it in us to we're still alive we can still go back to the deen and and set things right between ourselves guide our spouses guide our uh, uh, seek knowledge for ourselves also do the correct tarbiyah of the children inshallah yeah and maybe in one of the future sessions inshallah we will have uh, a series on uh, you know nurturing iman in in the children inshallah inshallah biiznillah type so this is also important and of course we have children inshallah allah has blessed us with children so they will when they get onto the bus make sure it's the right bus right make sure they have the right choices in terms of the wife and in terms of the husband and for us parents it's for us to to guide this choices to to advise them and so on and so so forth we also saw the uh, the hadith of the khutbah al wida or uh, on araf from arafa mount arafa where rasulullah in his first and last hajj he gave the famous sermon the farewell sermon as they call it and this extra, extract is from that sermon wherein he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam fear allah concerning your women where you have taken them on the security of allah so when you get married we said we are taking this wife uh, as as our wife we are taking this muslima as our wife in the name of allah with the khutbah al hajja uh, with witnesses and and you know so these these things are very important and very critical it's just it's not just a marriage it's not a court marriage it's something which we take uh, you know we have to take seriously uh, and and allah uh, rasulullah said sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, you can chastise them if if they if they um you know go against your wishes in terms of the sharia but not severely and we discussed this yesterday as well and he he also said sallallahu alaihi wasallam their rights upon you is that you provide with them food and clothing in a fitting manner right so we discussed this already yesterday we're just doing a quick uh, recap and i also gave you a kind of an assignment 
to kind of reignite that dormant love, dormant love, yeah, dormant, yeah, like you have a dormant volcano, right? Type. So to, to reignite that love, to, to kindle that passion again between the husband and wife, not to start a fight, inshallah, I hope, you know, you all slept peacefully last night. Uh, you didn't have any fights, inshallah. Um, and, and the instructions were quite straightforward. Uh, if you haven't got the file, let me know. It's on the Go, uh, OneDrive, which I, the link which, uh, where I've got the recordings. I also sent it on the Telegram group. Um, so one file is for the wife, one file is for the husband to work at. And then you can compare notes if you wish. If you feel you can you know, do that without starting a fight, inshallah, that's good. But the point is to improve. The point is to judge where we stand and how to uh, be a better husband or uh, be a better wife as the case may be, right? Um, and uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to send the sheets back to me. It's for you. It's your personal use. So uh, you can keep using. Maybe uh, six months down the line, one year uh, down the line, you want to again do the performance check yeah, to see if you have actually improved and see how you rate compared to the last uh, rating, right? That's good to do. So you can, you can store, save that file and uh, maybe six months, one year, depending on your own uh, judgment. You may want to do the exercise again and see where, how you fare, whether you have improved or you're going down, right? So inshallah, inshallah, you're improving. Inshallah, you are doing. And we hope Allah blesses and uh, puts his barakah in, in all the marriages of the Muslims. Ameen. Right. So we started talking about rights. We looked at the rights of the wife, first of all. We discussed all this yesterday. We want to do a quick recap. Uh, and we said the most important thing in terms of the wife's right upon the husband is that he, um, he provides for her, uh, gives her the right resources, or he himself provides for her the right Islamic guidance and education, right? Um, because usually, and this is how it should be, he is exposed to more of the Islam in terms of the halakat, the, the durus, the masajids, uh, um, Islamic centers, and so on and so forth. Usually, usually, depending, you know, usually, it's not, a, it's not a rule. Usually, the wife doesn't have this kind of complete exposure. So, it's his duty to, and his responsibility upon the wife that he, um, you know, uh, advises her. Uh, like, like the Juma khutbah is an example. He goes for Juma, and the wife is not required to attend Juma. It is not needed of her. So when he goes for the Juma khutbah, how many of us husbands come back and tell our wives what was discussed in the khutbah? Simply, akhi. Simple as that. This itself is good and good. good and this is dawa. This is dawa. You're doing dawa. So come home and talk to your wife. Tell her, you know, Jazakillah khair. This is what the Imam spoke about today. It was a good khutbah and he talked about this and this and this. Khalas. Alhamdulillah, this is good. And she will have her own points. She will have her own comments and so on, right? So uh, we talked about that. We also mentioned the other case, the, the, the vice versa of it. Uh, what if the wife is, is more religiously inclined than the husband? And this could be possible. And, and we have seen this also in, in many cases that the wife, alhamdulillah, is, is a practicing Muslimah, but the husband, yani, nusnus. Huh? Nusnus. He's like, you know, a bit here and a bit. One, one foot in dunya, one foot in, in, in akhara. Something like that. Huh? Uh, I, I, there are people like this, of course. We're all, we're all like this, alhamdulillah. So now it is the job of the wife to guide the husband. And you know, it's difficult. Wallahi, sometimes it can be very difficult. Uh, you know, we men, the problem with, with, with us men is that we think we know everything. Yeah? It's true, Yani. We, we men, we, we think we know everything. Eh, what does she know? Deen? You want to tell me about Deen? What do you know about Deen? Okay, go sit in the kitchen and, and do your work. This, this is how we behave, right? So a wife needs to understand this. And she needs to handle this with care. And like we said yesterday, a husband is like any other kid. You know, if, if you tell the husband, uh, let's say the, the husband, you know, the wife goes and tells the husband, oh, you're only watching movies. You're only watching TV. Uh, you don't grow a beard. You're, you're smoking. Ah, ah, ah. He will never change. He will continue watching more movies to irritate the wife. He will continue shaving to irritate the wife. And he will continue having a cigarette to irritate the wife. Where have you done your job? So it's important, you know, to handle, it's like a kid. You tell the kid, you know, don't touch that jar of chocolates. He will go and touch the jar of chocolates. He will break the jar of chocolates and he will take the jar of chocolates. He will take the chocolates. A kid is just like that. We all have kids. We've seen this. You tell them not to do something, they will do that thing. A husband is just like a kid. Wives, keep this in mind. Anyway. Sisters, keep this in mind. So you have to treat them as you treat a kid. You have to know when to talk to him about something, catch the right opportune moment and put it across. Yeah, this is important. We discussed this yesterday, alhamdulillah. And uh, we also talked about many cases uh, in, in Sira. We talked about Ahadith. We said financially, she has, the wife has rights upon the husband. 
uh, in terms of uh, good food and clothing and shelter and so on and so forth. And we talked about the hadith of Hind with Utbah, the wife of Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan, sorry, who came complaining to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about her stingy husband, right? We discussed this. And this applies across all cases. And we also said the husband's wealth is his wealth and he's free to do with it as he pleases as long as he's taking care of the rights of the wives and the families, right? So that's, that's his wealth, alhamdulillah. And we said the husband uh, should treat the wives uh, fairly, kind treatment, they should not be harmed. We discussed the hadith of the miswak. Uh, as, as the Sahaba said, you know, as, as Allah says, you, it's okay to hit them as a last resort. And he showed the miswak. You hit it with the, it's like hitting with the miswak. There's hardly any injury. So it's not about uh, putting a black eye, a dis disfiguring, uh, uh, burn marks. Uh, this is not a joke. You, you must be laughing, but we ha I have seen cases of, of sisters uh, complaining, complaining about these. These, these happen amongst Muslim families and husbands are doing this. And this is, oh, I was angry. Of course you were angry. Yani. Nobody does this when he's happy. The point is to control yourself. Your brothers and sisters, everybody gets angry. Even the wife gets angry. So the point, point is to control yourself. Seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. A'udhu billahi minish shaitan nir rajeem. Yeah? And we also said a wife has the right to uh, sexual enjoyment as a husband would, would want to approach her. She also likes to have her husband approach her. Uh, so this is up to the husband for, to fulfill those rights. We discussed this, uh, staying one night out of every four nights, if there's polygyny involved, for example. Uh, and we talked about it. And finally, we also said that the husband should, alhamdulillah, inshallah, allow uh, the wife to visit her relatives. And we said the wife has left everything at the drop of a hat. She has left everything. When, when, when she said, when khubul kiya, and you said khubul kiya, you did the khubuliyat, khalas. She has left her parents, she has left her brothers, she has left her sisters, all for one person. Only one person. And that's you, the brother, the husband. Right? So keep this in mind, brothers. She, has, she also has a family. Like how you like your parents, like how you like your brothers and sisters. She also likes her brothers and sisters. She also has love for them. They also have love for her. So why are you depriving her of this connection? This is Silat al Rahm. This is connection of the womb. And this is a major sin to cut it off. And if she's forced to cut it off because of you, the sin is upon you as the husband. Okay, Thay, brothers and sisters, when I say you, I don't really mean you, you personally. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. Please bear with me. This is my manner of speaking. I'm trying to avoid it. I'm trying to change, inshallah. You know, but sometimes the, the words slip out. So it's, when I say you, I don't mean you personally. I'm sure, alhamdulillah, you're all uh, above this and you're all good practicing brothers and sisters. Al inshallah, alhamdulillah. Uh, but it is just a way of speaking. So please do not have anything, any grudges against me or anything, nothing personal. Khairan. So we, we discussed this. Now we want to move on to, yeah, sorry, we also saw these ahadith which kind of complement the previous slide. Uh, various ahadith of Rasulullah talking about treating your women the best. And he connected treating the women or the treating the wives to, uh, to, to iman, to believe in iman. So he said it's like a part of iman that the one who is the best in, in, in treating of the women. And he said, you should not lash your wives like you lash your slaves, for example. And then in the night you go and sleep with her. How is it possible? Yani? You're angry with her. You said you're angry. You hit her because you're angry. And then in the night you're happy with her. Kef, yani. This is being egoistic. This is being selfish. So you want to get what you want. And then you take it out on her. This is not correct. Yani. The same thing happens. I've seen cases also where people come in, you know, upset from the office, right? They, they, are, they have a bad day at, the work, at work. And they come and take it out at the families, at their wives. This is not fair to them. It's not fair to the wives. They were not the ones responsible for your bad day at work. Maybe you were responsible. Again, when I say you, maybe the husband was responsible. Maybe he didn't do his uh, whatever presentation right or assignment right and his manager was upset with him. Whatever the reasons, whatever the causes, keep these issues within the confinements of the office atmosphere. Do not carry your office work home. This is a major mistake. Many brothers do this. They carry off office work home and they end up, uh, they want to take out their, you know, yeah, any, uh, anger on someone and it's the wife, the poor wife who gets it. Yeah, any, subhanallah, in front of the manager, the husband is a chicken. In front of the manager, he's a chicken. He comes home and he acts as a monster in front of his wife. You should continue to be chicken. <laughs> Why are you changing the colors? Yeah. So we, we, all, we, all want to, we all want to come out of this, right? But the wife is not the target. Yeah, you, want, you want to take it out, go for a drive, I don't know, sit at the beach, uh, I don't know how you take out your, your anger and frustration. Pray to Rakat Salah and then come home, Alhamdulillah. Bring a bouquet of roses for your wife. 
Yeah, anyway, why do you, we, this, this is a common cause of disagreements and arguments as well. The wives complain that the husband comes home and he starts blasting for no reason because he's had a bad day at work. So anyway, we should learn to manage these boundaries. Uh, as husbands, we are more uh, mature, inshallah. We are more senior, inshallah. We have seen the world, inshallah, more than the wives. So we should learn how to how to handle these things. Yani. This is yani, uh, not, not, not fair on, on the wives, yani, please. Um, and we want to move on. We saw about all of this. We said uh, Rasulullah also never hit his, uh, any of his wives or even a servant all his life. Yeah. Um, and onward. Right. So uh, we want to now look at uh, this hadith, which we also looked at yesterday. Uh, the hadith of Muad ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu, narrated by Anna, Abdullah ibn Abu Wafa, radiallahu anhu, that uh, Muad, when he came back from Sham, he prostrated to Rasulullah. Because he saw the, uh, the, the Christians prostrating to the archbishops, to the Pope, to the clergy, and so on. Yeah? So he saw Rasulullah is a prophet. He's bigger than them. So he deserves prostration more. So his intention was good. His intention was good. But he didn't have the knowledge, obviously. So Rasulullah obviously prohibited that. And he said, if, if I was to allow anyone to prostrate to somebody else other than Allah, because we know prostration, sajda is only to Allah. We don't bow down to anybody else. That's why karate, you know karate? Pumangchu, yeah, nunchaku, yeah, nunchaku karate, yeah, the martial arts, uh, or is it, yeah, it is karate, where they start off by bowing to each other. So you have the two opponents and, and, they, and they bow to each other. This is haram. This is not allowed. So if you can do karate without the bowing, fine. But if you have to bow, avoid karate. Don't, don't do karate. Because this position of bowing is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The position of sajda is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not bow, nor do, we, nor do we prostrate to anything or anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Barakallahu feekum. Wada taib. Um, so he said, if I was to allow that, I would have the woman prostrate to her husband. Why? Because of the stature the, the, the husband has uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has given him this, this stature over the wife. But then with the stature, as we said, with the stature or stature, comes responsibilities. The husband has, has to take care of that. He can't just take the stature of it. Okay, the Quran says this, so I'm going to do this. No. You have to, with that comes, you comes with rights, comes responsibilities. We said yesterday. yesterday. So with this, with, this, with this authority, they also come responsibilities. Right? Barakallahu feekum. Uh, now we move on to uh, the brothers. So we, Islam does not leave out the husbands as well. Islam has a lot to say about the husbands. And uh, we want to see that. We want to see what are the rights uh, uh, of a husband are over his wife. Type. First of all, obedience in matters of good. What do I mean by this? Obedience is simple and clear. The wife, okay, please, this is simple, simple English. Yani, barakalafikum, sisters who are listening and wives who are listening, uh, youngsters, young girls who are listening, who inshallah will get married. You are required by Allah, not by me, not by me, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to obey your husband. Even if you don't like it. In all matters of good. In matters which do not go against the sharia. What do I mean? If your husband asks you, for example, you're a practicing Muslim, you got married to this boy and he tells you, don't wear the hijab, you don't look good when you go out, you know. You look like this and you look like that, you know. People stare at us, don't wear the hijab. Are you going to obey him or not? Because I said, you have to obey your husband in this matter, because this is a matter of Sharia. This is a matter of divine revelation. This is a matter which is mentioned in the Quran, Surah Nur, Surah Ahzab. This is a matter which Allah has decreed upon the Muslimat. The husband has no say in this, absolutely no say. So you do not obey him in this. But of course, you should know how to handle it. You know, you want to be obstinate, you, 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 you say, Khalas, Ustad said, I don't obey you in this. It's going to trigger more issues. So again, you should, as a wife, see, for the wife uh, to have a peaceful life in her house, it's all about management. Or mismanagement, or the lack of it, if you, for, the, for the flip side, right? It's all about managing your husband. It's how you, how you manage him. Just like a child. Well, I just like a child. Treat him like a child. And you'll have a happy home. Inshallah. Bismillah. So in this case, you do not. But for example, in anything else, yeah, he, he wants you to go out with him, for example, uh, to his, um, I don't know, father's house or to his uh, awalima, which they've been invited to. Obey him. Go with him, inshallah. 
He said, this is required. So obedience is, is required from, by the wife to the husband. This is the first right. In all matters of good, as long as it does not require disobedience to Allah. Because as per the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is no obedience. And this applies to everybody. Huh? This applies to men and women, uh, husbands, wives, young, old, everybody. This hadith. There is no obedience to the creation in disobedience to the creator. There is no obedience to creation in disobedience to the creator. You do not obey the creation, makhluk, by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This, this should be very clear. This is a fundamental principle. Barakallah fikum. And if you look at it, subhanAllah, let me tell you a hadith. The wives who are listening, the sisters who are listening, please pay attention. A beautiful hadith, your, your ticket into Jannah. And very simple, very simple. For us men, it's more difficult actually. I will tell you another hadith after that. To enter Jannah. What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? And this hadith is in Dharmi, also in Abu Dawood and Sahih. He sallallahu alayhi wa said, and Tirmidhi, sorry, as well, in, in Sahih. Uh, the, the woman, the, the wife of the woman, who performs her five daily prayers, the woman who performs the five daily prayers, fasts the month of Ramadan, guards her chastity, and obeys her husband. Ya Khawad, only four points. The lady, the Muslima, who performs her five daily prayers, five salawat, fard, fasts the month of Ramadan, fard again as a Muslima, guards her chastity, hijab, uh, demeanor, personality, everything, and obeys her husband. She will be asked to enter paradise from any gate that she wants. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. This hadith is reported by Abu Naim radiallahu anhu from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sahih. How many gates does paradise have? How many gates? Eight. Paradise has eight gates. And hellfire has seven gates. So there's one extra gate to paradise. Allah wants more people to enter paradise. But it's we who are, you know, keeping away. Subhanallah. So simple. Again, a Muslimah I will repeat it, a Muslim who, who prays her five daily prayers, fasts the month of Ramadan, guards her chastity, huh, and obeys her husband. She will be asked by Allah on the day of judgment to enter Jannah through any gate which she wishes. Allah, sisters, wives, what more do you want? Khalas, yani. Simple and easy. All of us are already doing most of this. We just have to tweak our lives to fill in the gaps and fill in any uh, you know, issues which are here and there. We pray five daily prayers, inshallah. Ramadan comes, we fast. And if you miss the fast due to height, you make it up, alhamdulillah, inshallah. This is fine. This is included in the hadith. Because Allah knows you, you may have your periods during Ramadan. So you will make it up, inshallah. And guarding your chastity, this is what is important. The hijab, when you go out, huh? uh, and with your cousins, with your brother-in-laws, this is guarding chastity. If you're not doing this, start doing it. Tweak it here a bit. Tweak it. I'm sure you're doing it to some extent, but inshallah, complete it. And obey your husband. Khalas. Thank you. I will do it, inshallah. Finish. Simple and easy. You will enter Jannah. Even if you don't like your husband, isn't it worth the, the price to pay? Al Jannah. Al Jannah, your brothers, sisters. Even if you don't like, even if you're angry with him, obey him. Keep your focus on Al Jannah. Even when, even when you have a fight and you obey him, he will think, hey, what happened to her? Why is she not fighting back with me? Why is she not answering back? What, what's wrong? And then he will cool, cool down, inshallah. See, the point is not about me and you. The point is not the husband and wife saying, I, I win or you. It's not, it's not a boxing match, like we said yesterday. It's not about who is the title holder. It's about ensuring you worship Allah in a peaceful manner. Raising a righteous family. That's what marriage is all about. It's not about I win and you lose, or you win and I lose. No. Even if you're right, whoever it is, husband or wife, what's the problem in giving, giving in? No issue. It's only your wife. It's only your husband. What's the problem? Say, so what about the men? You see how difficult it is for the men, for the husbands. Once Rasulullah Sallallahu after Fajr Salah, after Fajr, this is after Fajr, the early morning Salah, the day has just started yet. Yani. Not even started yet. Yani. It's Fajr Salah. So he turned around and he said, who amongst you, this is Madina, who amongst you has, uh, has, has visited a sick person today? Today, the day has just started. Not even started. 
It's Fajr. Abu Bakr Siddiq raised his hand. The Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, Who amongst you has uh, given Sadaka today? Abu Bakr Siddiq raised his hand. And uh, who amongst you, there was something else, I forget the hadith, is fasting today. Jazakallah khair, is fasting today. Abu Bakr Siddiq raised his hand. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever combines all of this in a day will enter Jannah. So the, 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 the hadith, the narrator was saying, you know, Abu Bakr's hand was shooting up and we had just started our day. So how can you compete with such a person? Really? So Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, I, I, when I was leaving home, I came to him, Abdul Rahman was sick. So I went and visited him on the way to the masjid. And as I was coming to the masjid, I saw a poor person, I gave him sadaqa. And Alhamdulillah, I'm fasting today. So it's much more difficult for, for, for and this is in Fajr, early morning. Yani. And for the sisters, it's so simple. And this hadith, I'm sure, I don't remember. Let me get it to you next week. I think it has one more point. I, I, I'm forgetting. Um, I don't think I have it in my notes either. Uh, time. Inshallah, it will come. Or next next session, inshallah, I will. I think there was one more point to it. Barakallah fikum. So, obedience in matters of good. Time. Uh, guarding. The, the second right of the, the husband over his wife is that she guards his property and honor when... Uh, he's away when he's not at home, he's traveling, he's on a journey. Uh, uh, even if he's in the office, she's responsible for the house. If she's also working outside, take a look at this. If she's also working outside, who's going to guard the property and honor? Who's going to take care of the children? The maid servant, right? The maid is going to take care of the children. And then what all can the husband do with the maid? Yeah? Subhanallah. Right. So guarding his property and honor is the second right of the wife, uh, sorry, of the husband upon the wife. Type. Right. Uh, this is straightforward and nothing much about this and, and uh, all the early uh, Muslimat of the Salaf Yani would do this Yani. Uh, not to leave his house so not to leave the house without his permission this is important many sisters do not either know this or don't or they take it very lightly this is a right upon, of the husband upon the wife she cannot leave, her, leave the house without seeking his permission even if he's in the office give him a call send him a message you know, I need to go here, I need to go there, this is urgent or whatever. Yeah, and then he says, okay, Alhamdulillah, you can go. Otherwise, you remain in the house. Um, traveling with him if he desires. This is the other right of the husband upon the wife. That uh, if, you, if he wants you to go, like we discussed a bit earlier, with, with him anywhere, even on a journey, you should uh, comply, inshallah. Type. Um, again, quite, quite straightforward. Giving in to him when he desires. We talked about the rights of the wife and we discussed that she also has desires and she should uh, have those fulfilled in a halal way by her husband. So likewise, the husband also has his desires and uh, when, he, when he calls his wife, she should respond. We already saw the hadith earlier, the long hadith about uh, prostrating to the husband. And in the last part of the hadith, Rasulullah said, she should answer him even if she's on a, even if she's on a camel's Saddle in another riwayat, even if she is having bread in the tandoor or tannur, yeah, baking, she should leave it and go. Uh, when when he wants uh, to, to approach her and when he calls her, she should respond. In a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, uh, "If a husband goes to bed angry with his wife because she called him and she didn't respond, he's angry with her, and he goes to bed in this state." The angels will curse the wife the whole night through. The entire night, the wife is receiving the curses of the angels. The angels are asking Allah to curse the wife. The whole night. You see, these things are put into place by Islam. Why? Why? See, this is one, this is one of the main reasons of marriage. And we'll talk more about the manners of the bed today, inshallah, a bit later. But these, these are uh, put in place to protect both the husband and the wife so that they don't go looking elsewhere for these desires to be fulfilled. I mean, so as we saw the hadith earlier on of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, it, it happened with him as well. Sallallahu, and this is the beauty of the deen, that the Prophet was sent, who was a human being like us, who used to walk in the markets like us, speak like us, eat like us, married like us. So it's easier to follow him. As Allah says in the Quran, if, a, if an angel was sent as a Prophet, the people would say, oh, okay, he's an angel. Oh, come on, he's an angel. How can, how can we do what he's doing? He's an angel. Different creation, totally. So Allah sent a human being who was just like us. 
All the prophets, all the prophets. You read Surah Shura, Surah Anbiya, everything. It talks about people, uh, the prophets amongst you. The, your brother, your brother, your brother Saleh, your brother uh, Hud, and so on and so forth. So these things are, are Rasulullah he went out of his house. His, his eyes fell on a non-Maharam lady. He immediately went back into his house and approached his wife. And then he said this famous hadith, he said, uh, if one of you uh, by chance, you know, sees this, uh, <clears throat> subhanAllah, sees something which is, which is haram for him, his eyes fall on something which he should not be seeing, let him go and approach his wife because the wife has the same thing which she has. And which is true. You are all human beings. Like we said, Allah has allowed us spouses from amongst ourselves. So the wife has the same thing which she has. And go and fulfill your desires with her. Khalas, alhamdulillah. Everybody's happy. So this is important. And I'll give you a beautiful story of Umm Sulaim. We talked about Umm Sulaim, if you remember. You remember who, who is Umm Sulaim? Radiallahu anha. We discussed about her uh, marriage to Abu Talha. Abu Talha, right? Uh, and and uh, how uh, his mahar to her was um, his Islam, right? We discussed this, if you remember, uh, last session or the previous session, right? Uh, so... Um, this hadith I mentioned to you about the angels cursing the wife until the morning is in Bukhari and in Muslim. It's also in your student notes, the ones you have downloaded, inshallah, from the link type or from the group. Type. So, um, so Abu Musulaim, <coughs> sorry, uh, and this hadith is narrated by uh, Anas bin Malik. He said that Abu Talha had a son. It was Abu Musulaim and Abu Talha, they had a son. And this son fell sick when Abu Talha was away. He was away on a journey. Uh, and while Abu Talha was away, still not returned, uh, the son passed away. Their son, his and Umm Sulaim's son, passed away. Abu Talha was, did not know about the death because in those days there was no technology, of course. So when he came back home, yeah, Umm uh, uh, um Sulaim had covered up the boy and he kept him in a corner of, of the house with a coffin. So when Abu Talha came home, of course he didn't see this, he inquired about the child and he was tired. He was, came back from the journey. He had a hard uh, day or multiple days he was away. So he was exhausted. So he inquired about the child. And in one riwayat, Umm Sulaim said, he's very quiet. In another riwayat, she said, he's better than before. He's better than before. Both are sahih, inshallah. Allah wala. Then she made dinner for him. Hot, good, hot, uh, good meal. He had his food and she slept with him. They, they did it together that night. Can you imagine this woman? Can you imagine this Muslima? The sisters who are listening, the wives who are listening. Yani, uh, this is uh, yani, as good as it gets. Her son has passed away. She avoided that. She didn't want to burden the husband with this news as soon as he came in. He's dead. He's not even sick. He's dead. She wanted to fulfill his rights. She gave him a good meal. She slept with him. The next morning she said, Ya Abu Talha, Abu Talha, sorry, Abu Talha. He said, yes. He said, how is it if somebody uh, gives a loan to somebody else? Then party A gives a loan to party B. So party B is borrowing something from party A. And then when party A wants it back, they don't return it. He said, right. So she, he said, Abu Talha said, no, it's a loan. They should give it back. Then she said, go and make preparations for your son's funeral. He passed away. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. This is why these people are in the highest levels of Jannah. You see, they don't get to Jannah being CEOs of companies. They don't get to Jannah being shaking hands with non muharram people. They don't get to Jannah with uh, flaunting their beauty outside, outside the house. They don't get to Jannah with, uh, you know, uh, putting their faces on Facebook and talking about their bodies and their cook dishes and their houses, displaying everything for the public, for public to see. This is not why they are in Jannah, in the highest levels of Jannah. This is why. This is a classical example. And she's a human being. She's not a prophet of Allah. Billah. She's a human being like you and me. So if she can do it, why can't we? So she said, and the way she put it, she gave us a similitude. She gave an example and a knowledge, analogy. If somebody borrows something, because this, this children we have, the, the, the offspring we have is from Allah. Allah gave it to gave it gave them to us, and He He has the right to take it, take them away. We have no say in the matter. And Abu Talha agreed. He said, "Yes, they should give it back." So then she said, 
go and make few, uh, preparations for son's funeral. Abu Talha was shocked. Abu Talha was shocked. He said, why, why didn't you tell me this yesterday? So he was upset and he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this happened during the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he uh, mentioned to him the story. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him uh, that Allah, he, he, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, um, may, Allah, may, may Allah bless you last night. Did, did you any, do it last night? He said, yes. He said, may Allah bless your, your act, action last night. And then Umm Salam was pregnant. So Rasulullah made dua for them. Umm Salam was pregnant. She gave birth to a child. Rasulullah himself did tahnik to him. That is, he chewed a date and put the saliva and the syrup in, and rubbed it with the, on the child's gum. And he, he called him Abdullah. He gave him the name Abdullah. So the child was born uh, to, uh, after this uh, intercourse between Abu Talha and Umm Salam. And Rasulullah blessed their action and gave baraka to the child. And subhanAllah, see what happened. The hadith, uh, the, the history and Islamic scholars say, this child had seven children again, seven boys. And all of them were huffad of Quran. All of them were memorizers of Quran. So you see, brothers and sisters, good deeds are never lost. Good deeds are never lost. Even if your husband is a bit angry, if you take the lower, lower yani, uh, uh, if you bend down to him, yani, uh, and, and you have sabr and patience uh, for the sake of Allah, this, this deed of yours will be heaviest, inshallah, on the day of judgment on your scales. And inshallah, this, you will get your reward also in dunya, inshallah, inshallah. So you see, these, these are the kinds of wives uh, which we are talking about and, 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 the, and the rights of the husband. Another like, classical example, Khatija Radilanha. Khatija, we know the first wife of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? We discussed about her briefly in uh, session number two. Uh, so, uh, and we said how, how, how uh, doting she was on, on Rasulullah. She loved him very much. She didn't allow him to do any work in the house. Rasulullah would work in his house uh, in all the other wives after Khatija. But in Khatija's house, she didn't allow him to do anything. Even if he wanted to do, she, she, she did it for him. Any of his work. Uh, and she was such a fantastic wife, as we know, uh, and, and we've, we've heard all the hadith. And this hadith of, of Jibreel alayhi salam, uh, some of you may already know it. Jibreel alayhi salam came down once to Rasulullah and he told him, Khatija is approaching you with a plate of uh, seasonal fruits or in another riwayat, some dish. So she's coming into your room with some food and so, or some fruit. Convey her, convey to her my salam. Sorry, before that, uh, he told uh, Jibril told Allah Islam told Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, give her the glad tidings of a palace in Jannah, made of pearls, huh? made of pearls where there is no noise and no hard work, because she used to work very hard in the house. Give her the glad tidings of a palace in Jannah. Where there is made of pearls, made of pearls, where there is no noise and no hard work. So if there is glad tidings of a palace in Jannah, where will the person end up after his death? Inshallah, Jannah. Alhamdulillah. And we know this from the hadith of Rasulullah. Not only that itself is good enough, Yani. For you and me, that is fantastic. That is great news. That's what we're working for. Not only that, there's a bonus now. And Jibreel said, convey to her my salam. Allah. The salam of the archangel, the leader of the angels. Not only that, and conveyed to her the salam of Allah from above the seven heavens. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, who is Khadija in front of Allah? Nothing. Nothing, ya khi. Absolutely nothing. But Jibreel said, conveyed to her the salam of Allah from above the seven heavens. Why? Yani, she's a human being like you and me. What did she do to deserve this special honor? What did she do to deserve this special, special, special uh, privilege? How is she different? See, as sisters, as wives, we should relate to these things. We should purchase the books of uh, um, the seerah of these ladies. There is a book called, you know, Great Women of Islam, for example, or The Wives of the Prophet Islam. There's another book. Please read those books instead of watching YouTube and, and, and other nonsense stuff. Read these books and understand why these women who are human beings like you and me, they are not special. They were not prophets. They did not re receive revelation. Shaitan did come to them as well. 
So how come they achieved it when we cannot? Definitely we know it is not impossible because they did it. So all we need to do is try. Have the right uh, uh, mindset, have the right frame of mind, have the right understanding of our roles and responsibilities, our position in society, and work towards it. Khalas, inshallah, you will be along with Khatija as her neighbor, inshallah. Ameen, may Allah make it possible. Ameen, inshallah. Like it's not difficult. All it requires is some sincere effort. And if you do something for the sake of Allah, you will see how Allah makes the matter so easy for you. And there are many other uh, examples like this, but these are just a couple of examples uh, we wanted to talk about. Mm. Also, the hadith I mentioned yesterday about uh, Umm Salama, right? About when she was having her cycles and she would uh, put a piece of cloth over her, Rasulullah would put a, put a cloth over her private parts. This was wrong. It was Aisha, not Umm Salama. But there's another hadith of, I, of Umm Salama that when she started having her hayat, uh, she was a bit embarrassed. And Rasulullah asked her, is it, is it, are you having your cycles? She said, yes. He said, this is what Allah has decreed for the children or the daughters of Adam al Islam. And he came and slept with her under the same cover. He slept with her next to her in under the same blanket. So it was not something she was going to be, uh, you know, uh, ostracized for, is that the right word, or boycotted for. Uh, he slept with her, he cuddled her, and, all, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, that's, that's a small correction. Jazakumullah khairan. I made a mistake yesterday in uh, the, who narrated that hadith. It was Aisha. And this is the one, the one about Umm Salama. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, seeking his permission for nafil fasts. Yeah? Seeking his permission for nafil fasts. So uh, if a Muslim wants to fast nafil, itnain, uh, yom al khamis, yom al itnain, Middle of the month, Ayyam al Bayid, the, the white days as they call it, when the moon is full, um, Ashura, um, Muharram, right? Um, Arafa, Yom al Arafa, yeah? Or any other days she wishes to, for nafil, nafil. She has to seek the permission of her husband. If he says no, no. If he says yes, Alhamdulillah. This is his right. So you go to him and say, yeah, Habi, I know I want, I want to fast uh, tomorrow. Which fast is it? Yom al No, you cannot fast. That's it. This is right. And he's not doing anything wrong in saying no. Why? Why? A, this is the hadith of Rasulullah. We hear and we obey. And B, maybe he wants, he has desires in that day for her. If she's fasting, she will break her fast. It's up to him to say no. But Ramadan fasting, no. Because Ramadan is, a, is an obligation, is a duty which the Muslima as well as the Muslim, the Muslima uh, owes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is Allah's right upon the Muslima. So Ramadan, there is no need for any permission. Khalas. Ramadan, you fast Ramadan. Even the days you're making up after Ramadan, uh, the husband may ask you, what are you fasting today? He says Ramadan, Khalas. he keeps quiet. He has no right to tell you not to fast because it's Ramadan fast. Barakla fikum. Taib. Um, So these were, uh, and you see only six rights of the husband or the wife. Uh, the rights of the wife and the husband were, I think, eight. So even then, the, the ladies, you know, they kind of have an upper hand, inshallah. Yeah. So these are, these are the rights of the husband uh, over the wife. Um, also in a hadith, okay, I'll let me mention this maybe when we talk about the next section. So this is in general in what we want to talk about the rights of the husband or the wife, simple and easy, not too many, but the first one is what is most important. The first one is the one which causes the most problems in, in families. The wives feel that, you know, why should I obey him? Common question. The sisters ask, why should I obey him? He said, he tells me, this, why, why should I listen to him? Why, why, why? We'll see that in the next slide. See, again, Islam is a beautiful deen. It has taken care of all your questions. The answers are all right there in front of you, but it is for us to accept those answers, acknowledge that, and put it to practice. That's where we are lacking. Islam is not lacking. Islam has defined everything. Islam has defined also the answers to your questions. But the problem is these answers we don't like. We don't like these answers. Right? So we have these problems. I put this slide together just to give you an idea of the whole 
it's not only for the wives and the husbands, it's generally also in Islam. See, we have Islam. And what is the definition of Islam? Islam is not peace. I know many scholars will tell you Islam is peace. Islam means peace. No, this is a lie. This is a lie generated by the kuffar. Islam does not mean peace. They want, you to, they want to make you into Gandhis. You know Gandhi? This half-naked guy who was in India. They want to make you, make, make you into him. Rasulullah was not a Gandhi. Audhu billah, astaghfirullah. Yeah, we seek refuge in Allah. We ask Allah to forgive us. So, Islam, what does it mean? The meaning of Islam is submitting your will to Allah whether you like it or not. This is Islam. Submitting one's will to Allah's will. W-I-L-L, will. You know, khayish or, or, or your desire. To Allah's will. Whether you like it or not. Who really likes to get up at 3.30 in the morning for Fajr? But this is Allah's will. And Fajr is at 3.30 in summer. So we get up at summer, Alhamdulillah, Samyana Watana, liking it, inshallah, and go to the masjid to pray salah. So the one who does this is a Muslim. The one who does this is a Muslim. Because this, this, this is the Arabic language. The one who does the act will have the move attached to it. Muslim. Adan, Adan, the act of Adan, the one who gives the Adan is who? Mu'addin, Mu'addin, the file. Uh, jihad, fi the one who does this is who? Mujahid, Mu again. So if you are a person, man or woman, who submits his or her will to Allah, fully loving it and liking it, seeking the pleasure of Allah, you're a Muslim and you're following Islam. Simple and easy. Right? So far with me, inshallah. So far, so good. So keep this in mind. You know what is Islam now? And you know who is a Muslim? So when you want, we want to look into ourselves and see, are we following what Allah is saying? Are we Muslims actually? Yes, we say we are Muslims. Our passport says Muslim, Islam. Huh? Our uh, birth certificate says Muslim. Our uh, school registration, uh, school passing out certificate says Muslim. Huh? Uh, passport says Islam. But are we really Muslim? Are we fulfilling all the commands of Allah? Samyana wa atana, I hear and we obey without any arguments. Without any, why should I obey him? Why, should, why is he saying this? Why does Allah say this? Audhu billah, astaghfirullah. Huh? Why is Allah not mentioning this? Khalas. You, are you a Muslim or no? I told you the definition. I told you the definition of Islam and I told you, told you the definition of Muslim. Simple and easy. So keep this in mind, please, as we go ahead. Surah Ahzab, ayat number 36. Surah Ahzab, ayat number 36. Revealed in the context of the marriage of Zainab bin Jahash to Zaid bin Haritha. We discussed this earlier. But the ruling applies to the end of time. What is this ayat? Allah says, meaning of which is, it is not for a believer, man or woman. So it is not for a believer, Muslim or Muslima, man or woman. That when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter, that they should have any option in their decision. Let me repeat it. It is not for a believer. Very serious, very dangerous ayat. Very dangerous ayat. Please have this ayat etched into, into your RAM, ROM, into your brains, into your DNA, RNA, whatever. This should not leave you till you die. It is not for a believer, man or a woman, that when Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have decreed a matter, that they should have any option in their decision. No options. Why should I obey him? Why am I below and he's above? Why can he work and I can't work? Why should I look after the kids and he goes out? Why does he get to have all the fun and I'm sitting at home? Ya khi, akhwat, sisters, wives who are listening. It is Allah who is saying this, not me. Allah is commanding you. It is up to you to accept or leave it. And what happens? The ayat continues. And whosoever disobeys Allah and his messenger, he has indeed strayed into a plain error. He has indeed strayed into a plain error. And immediately after this ayat was revealed, Zainab bin Jahash, she said, Rasulullah, I will marry Zaid bin Harith. And she didn't refuse. If you remember, she didn't refuse. She just said, let me think about it. She didn't say, she didn't say no. She just said, let me think about it, Rasulullah. Immediately Allah revealed this ayat. So very dangerous as for, for all of us. When, when Allah asks the husbands to take, uh, to take care of the rights of the wife, they have no decision in the, they have no option in the decision. Absolutely no option in the decision. 
When Allah says, tells, tells you through the hadith we saw, do not hit your wife. Khalas. Khalas, your brothers who are listening. Husbands. Shabab. It is not for a believer, man or woman, that when Allah and his messenger have decreed a matter, do not lash your wife, do not hit your wife, that they should have any option in the decision. Time. Now when you have a marriage, so keep this in mind, keep the definition of Islam, keep the definition of who is a Muslim in your mind, and the ayat I just narrated to you about Surah Al-Hazab, which basically in a nutshell, the takeaway home message from that ayat is that Samiyana wa atana. We hear and we obey. We hear and we obey. This is Islam. It goes back to the first uh, block. Now when a husband and wife, when a man and a woman come together to get married, right? Uh, bear in mind that there are bound to be differences. There is no single marriage on the face of this earth ever, ever. Even the marriage of the prophets. May Allah have mercy on all of, on all of, on all of them. Even they had differences with their wives, as we will see, inshallah, from the seerah a bit later. Because, see, the, the, the boy and the girl are from different families, different backgrounds, different tarbiyah, different cultures, uh, different education, different uh, mindset, and different, actually. The boy is different from the girl. The girl is different from the boy. The male is not like the female, as per the ayat we saw earlier. That's like the kalunsa. The male is not like the female. Allah says this, not me. Allah is saying this. So totally different people coming together to worship Allah. So there will be definitely differences between the two. Expect this. The brothers, the brothers and sisters who are going to get married, please keep this in mind. There is no Prince Charming or uh, Miss Universe out there. This is not real world. The real world is there will be differences. Alhamdulillah. It's how you sort this out, right? It's how you manage these differences. Keeping in mind the teachings of Islam. Keeping in mind the rights and responsibilities. So when there are differences, it is the wisdom of Allah that someone should have a final say. Otherwise, the difference will keep on going, keep on going, escalating, escalating, escalating. Finally, talaq, talaq, talaq. Yes or no? And we have all seen this. So one of them should have the final say. One of them should be able to put the, put the foot down, as they say. One of them, one of the two parties should listen to the other party to, to, to finish the argument, to solve the issue, to move ahead with life. Because we have other better things to take care of. We have the family, we have the rent, we have the work, we have the, uh, uh, I don't know, citizenship, residentship, the family, children's education. Uh, uh, so many things. If you keep fighting with each other, who, who's going to take care of the family and everything else? So someone should have the final say to, in order to resolve the issue. Otherwise, differences will multiply and disputes will increase. So if nobody's in charge, the marriage will uh, you know, go all over the place, deviate, flounder, whatever you call it. So Islam has made the husband the protector and maintainer of the wife and has given him the responsibility of heading the household because he's more perfect in rational thinking and wisdom and so on and so forth. And it is obligated, like we saw in the previous slide, for the wife to obey the husband. Allah says in Surah Nisa, ayat number uh, 34, meaning of which is, men are the protectors and maintainers of women. Because Allah has made one of them to excel the other. And because they spend from their means to support them. Khalas, it is Allah who is telling, telling you this, not me. It is not Abu Basim telling this, telling, telling this to you. Allah has said in Surah Nisa, ayat number 34, which will be recited to the end of time, that men are the protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has made one of them at a higher daraja, excel the other, and because they spend uh, from, their mean, uh, from their means to support the families. Khalas. So listen to your husband, as long as it is within the confinements of Sharia, and he's going to protect you, inshallah, and take care of you, inshallah. This is your right over him, as we already saw. So it works both ways and he's providing for you, taking care of you through the means. Like we discussed earlier, you know, you have a pilot, you have a Boeing 737 or Airbus A380. You can't have two pilots in the cockpit. You have to have one pilot and one co-pilot. If you have two pilots, one pilot will want to ascend, the other pilot will want to descend. One will want to go right, the other will want to go left. What will happen? You will crash your plane. 
You have to have one pilot, one co-pilot. A fantastic example. And the pilot is sleeping or goes, goes to have a bite. The co-pilot takes over. The co-pilot takes charge. The pilot is the husband. The co-pilot is the wife. Simple and easy. Surat Nisa. I have 34. You see where I'm going with all of this? That this is a two-way street. And we have to meet midway and make the marriage work. Both the parties. So the men are, have been given, been given the responsibility of protection and maintenance. So when somebody comes to attack your wife, you don't run away. You fight him back. Even if, even if it means getting killed in the bargain. This is protection. You maintain her by providing for her, taking care of her, taking her to the hospital when she wishes to go, when she has a problem, when she has an emergency. You don't say, oh, I'm praying, Kiamalel, Allahu Akbar. Okay, she's dying, she needs to go. Allahu Akbar, say, Allah, 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 Allah. Kiamalel, you leave it and you take your wife to the hospital. This is maintenance. You don't. You maintain her not by hitting her and disfiguring her. You maintain her by keeping her as it is maintenance. What is maintenance? You maintain a machinery, right? You maintain the house. You keep it as it is by, by painting it, uh, fixing the, the, the loopholes. Uh, a pipe breaks, you fix the pipe. Uh, plumbing issues, you, you sort it out. Electrical issues, you change the bulb. You're maintaining it. You don't change it. Just because a bulb breaks, you don't go and get a new house. You maintain the house. A bulb breaks, you don't dismantle the whole circuit board and thrash it to the floor. You fix the bulb. You get a new bulb and fix it. You maintain the house. Likewise, you maintain the wife. You don't like something she does, you don't divorce her and get a new wife. The drop of a hat. You try to fix the issues, inshallah. This is a, this is a responsibility. Just because you're above the, the wives doesn't mean you take this for granted and have a you know, uh, arrogant way in through the house. No, that there are things to be done along with this authority. Just as women are, are taking care of the children, women are better at this, right? Women are better at taking care of the children and household affairs. I mean, we have been staying at home uh, with this uh, coronavirus. Uh, most of the men, uh, subhanAllah, are working from home. And you see the kind of, uh, you see what it takes for the wife to keep the house running. It's not easy. I'm, I'm assuming, I'm talking about families where the wife is at home and the, and the husband is working. Not both are working, right? The wife is at home. You, you will realize and appreciate what the wife has to go through. And if, 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 if one day she's sick and she can't do something and you have to cook and you have to take care of the children, you will realize that this is not possible for a husband. That is why Allah has not made us to do this. Allah knows best. He knows what we can do. He knows our limitations. Likewise, he knows what the wives can do and he knows their limitations as well. But it is we who want to mix up matters. Aping the West. Wallah mushkila. So we each, each have our roles and responsibilities defined. We know what to take care of. Based on the Quranic ayat, all we have to do is implement the ayat. Simple and easy. Try this from today, inshallah, after we finish the session. Try to implement these ayat. And you will see the difference already. Inshallah, tabarakallah. May Allah make it easy for all of us. So this will take care of any chaos in the house, huh? chaotic scenes, issues, and so on and so forth. So the men, they spend on the wives, the men, they spend on the children, the men, they spend on the house. Within their capacity, of course. The wife shouldn't have unreasonable demands, right? Uh, yani, you, know, you know approximately how much your husband is making. A wife can, can ascertain this. She can make this out. She should not make unreasonable demands. Okay, Fala, Fala got this, so I want to do this. One of this neighbor got this, so even I want this. That neighbor got this. This is common among sisters and, and, and wives. They talk to each other. They share, okay, I got this. And today with Facebook and Instagram and everything, it's all over the public domain. So you see all what the, the rich and famous are getting, you also want it. So you see, this is why Islam has stopped all these things at the budding stage. But we didn't do it, right? We allowed it to happen. And today the husbands have to face the headache because the wives are nagging them. Because they've seen all this the other people have, right? And suddenly making the husband feel small. This is a very, very big, big mistake. Never make your husband feel smaller than what he is. Big mistake. So uh, the wife, the husbands, they, they go out, they make a living, they put food on the table. The wife should appreciate this. And uh, obey, obey him. Likewise, the husband should also appreciate the, the, the wife when he comes home. Is the, the house is neat and clean. As he left it, alhamdulillah, in spite of uh, four uh, uh, monstrous children in the house, all over the place, she was able to manage and keep them neat and clean. Alhamdulillah. This requires a lot of effort. 
it doesn't mean if a, if a person is a housewife, she's doing nothing. No. It, it, the work involved is much tougher, harder, if you ask me, than a sister working as an engineer or a doctor. Uh, and we should keep in mind that there is a reward for this, definitely. If, we, if you obey, the, obey Allah's commands, obey, Allah, obey Allah's ayat in the Quran, Allah will reward the wife for obeying the husband in good. And uh, Allah will also reward the husband for treating his wife kindly. So there is ajit definitely there, inshallah. Don't worry about it. Right? Uh, yani this, is, this is there. And, and uh, Allah says in Surah Baqarah, meaning of which is, and they that the women have rights similar as you have rights over them. So this is like a, we said a two-way street. So uh, men and women should understand this. So I want you to like, keep this infographic in mind. Yani, so you know, you, know, you know what I'm talking about and why uh, yani, what we do should be what we do. We don't want to jump into other, another's domain, another somebody else's stuff, the husband's stuff and vice versa and try to act as a husband or the husband try to uh, acting as a wife. It doesn't work really. Wallahi, it doesn't work. You, you see the West who championing this, right? All the families, majority of their families are broken. Children are into drugs, the d divorces in the family. Any, it's very rare to find a family where the husband and wife are still married. And they are talking to us about, uh, about husband and wife's rights. SubhanAllah. Look, look into your own uh, Garaban as this. Look into your own uh, turf. See the mess you have made. See, the problem is they don't want us. They're jealous of us. They're jealous of Islam. They want us in the same situation as them. And we are, subhanAllah, following them. Allah Akbar. So this is what I wanted to convey from this slide, that this is something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not from me. It is not from another sheikh or shuyuk or anybody else. It is from Allah. We are just parroting it. That's it. We are just conveying the message. We didn't, we didn't cook this up. We didn't coin this. It is Allah who is asking us to do and behave in the way we are supposed to do and behave. But if we agree, to, we decide to disagree and we try to um, uh, yani, jump into another's boundaries and turfs, we will have problems. Issues will escalate and marriages will break down. And not only that, you will have also the, the adab of Allah upon our heads. Allah will punish us for this. Yeah. Time. Uh, okay. We can still do this, I think, a bit more, inshallah. We have some time. Uh, also in a hadith from Imam Ahmad and Abu Dawood in Ibn Majah Sahih, uh, Allah says, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, upon you, that is upon the husbands, is their provision, the wife's provision and clothing from what is beneficial. And the woman is also responsible for establishing that which is required of her in her home, not in her office, office in her home, from supervision and reformation. So yani, the evidence is so many out there. There is no argument actually. Yani, if you want, I, I can have a separate dars with Q&A only to discuss women working outside. And it will go on for, um, believe me, for three or four hours. We can definitely, we can have one-to-one, -one, we can have one-to-many, we can sit, we can discuss. This is not the scope of it because this, the scope is broader for these series. But inshallah, if you want, if you're interested, if you still want to challenge this, we can have a discussion. No problem. I'm, 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 I'm more than willing because I have the evidences with me. I'm confident of Allah's speech. Khalas, it is there. It is we who are twisting these evidences. It's we are looking here and there to suit our vested interests. The evidences are clear, explicit, and as clear as night and day. As here Allah says, uh, required offer in the house, in the home. Halas. Ayat in the Quran, stick to your houses and do not expose yourself like the, people, like the women of Jahiliya. Halas. Why do you want to argue? I do not understand. Why don't you listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then you have problems in marriages, problems with children, problems with rape cases, and this and that, then you come and complain. Ya Sheikh, what to do? Ya Ustad, what to do? Ya Fala, what to do? Now you're, now you're thinking of the deen? What happened when the deen, when, when it was there in front of you? You ignored it intentionally. Again, when I, say, when I say you, I don't mean you personally. Please forgive me. It's nothing personal, but it is just a manner of speaking. Sorry, I'm sorry. Type. Uh, also, the, the hadith of uh, Rasulullah in Bukhari and Muslim that the woman is a shepherd in a home and she'll be questioned concerning her flock. A woman, a wife, is a shepherd in her home. Again, in her home, not in her office, managing her team of 20 men and maybe women as well. And she is the team leader. Is the hadith talking about office here? Home. Bukhari and Muslim Sahih. 
Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari. Because Bukhari has many, many has written many books. The Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. May Allah have mercy on them. A woman is a shepherd in her home. And she'll be questioned concerning her flock. Oh Allah, my flock was with the maid servant. My flock was with the daycare center. My flock was in the nursery. My flock was this. My flock was there. Who the hell asked you to leave them there? Again, not you. Who the hell asked the wife to leave them there? Oh, we want to work. We studied engineering. We studied medicine. We studied law. We studied fala. We studied fala. We want to, do you want me to waste it? Yes, please waste it. Please waste it. For the sake of Allah and for the sake of your happy family life. It has to be wasted. The blame is not on you. The blame is on the parents who made you study these degrees. Giving you an expectation that you can become fala, 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 fala. The blame is on the parents. And don't worry, this will not be wasted, inshallah, in the sense that this, this, this information you have got, the knowledge you have gained, will help you in the family. Through wisdom, uh, through you acquiring wisdom through this, on how to manage the children, how to manage the husband, this will help you. But it doesn't mean just because you, were, you were studied engineering, medicine, law, uh, uh, whatever, fala, 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 you have to work. That's not an argument. It's not that anywhere in the hadith. In fact, we have the contrary in the hadith. We are going against Islam. Not you again, sorry. The wife is, the, the girl is going against Islam. The sister is going against Islam. The Muslim, Jazakillah khair. May Allah bless you and reward you. Yani may Allah advise, forgive all of us and show us the right path. I mean. Simple, yeah, brothers and sisters. Yeah. It's very simple. Islam is simple. Time. We want to now move on to an area which uh, some people may wonder why I put it here. You know, it's something which is of, uh, maybe some people are embarrassed, ashamed. But you know, in Islam, Islam is, is a complete deen. It's a complete package. Uh, and we saw the hadith of Umm Salama when she had her uh, cycles. She was embarrassed. Uh, and and uh, another, another wife of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umm Al-Mumineen. Uh, please mute your mics. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, so uh, she, um, she had this and she came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she was embarrassed and she was shy. And she told Ya Rasulullah, uh, Allah is not shy of, of what he reveals. And not shy in his deen. He said, yes, Allah is not shy. So he said, she said, you know, I have this. She said, yes, this is something which is decreed by uh, Allah for the daughters of Adam alayhi salam. And if you look into the books of Hadith, you will find many a Hadith, many a Hadith talking about Rasulullah's manners in the bed. And how he behaved with his wives. Why is this important? Why is this even part of Islam? Why, is this, why, is, why did the scholars even collect this Hadith? Because these have a direct bearing on the family life. These have a one-to-one, -one direct, direct, directly proportional bearing on the family life. If the couple is lacking in the bed, this kind of, uh, what shall I say, uh, escalates or cascades into other disputes, other arguments, uh, fitan, uh, zina, and finally the marriage on the rocks. So we want to understand, again, this is the beauty of Islam. That Islam is a deen, is a complete way of life. It also talks about how a husband and wife behave in the most of private matters. And as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, They, the, the wives, libas, are libas lakum for you, for the men. And you, libas lakum, libas lakum, you are also libas for them, for the wives. What is libas? Libas uh, is, is a word which maybe you know, I think it's Urdu also, it's, it's a quite familiar word. Uh, it's, it's a garment which you wear, right? It's what, it's what you wear so to, to protect yourself, to cover yourself, and it is very close to you. It sticks to your skin. So Allah is saying, Subhanallah, this is the beauty of the Quran and the Arabic language. The Quran, first and foremost, Allah's speech, that Allah is describing the husband and wife as if they are garments to the body, protecting each other close to each other, touching each other. SubhanAllah, the beauty of the, of the Quran. Ayat number 187. It's an extra, extract of the ayat. The ayat is a much longer ayat, but this is yani, uh, part of the ayat. Uh, also, Allah says in the Quran uh, that your wives are a tilt unto you. So approach your tilt when and how you feel. Right? First and foremost, foreplay. Rasulullah said in the hadith, meaning of which is, do not, uh, please mute your mics. 
Barakallahu feek. So Rasulullah said in the hadith, do not approach your wives directly, but rather have some foreplay with them. And this is a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is, this is encouraged, this is preferred, and this is the sunnah. This is the sunnah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would never directly do the act. Audhu billah. He would start off by kissing, by cuddling, huh? with his wives to increase and, and uh, desires and arouse them. And all of us know, and see, uh, please bear with me, uh, there's nothing to be shy about. These are things which we should know. As husbands and wives, we should know this. If we don't know, we need to blame ourselves. Because the deen talks about it. And maybe that's why our marriages are not working. And the shabab and the youth and the brothers and sisters who are listening, who are going to get married, should also know about this. So there's no shyness in this, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah fiqh. Barakallah fiqh. Barakallah fiqh. So uh, also we know, we know from, from uh, the scholars give this reason as well. And, and all of us know this, the, husband, the married couples at least, that the man uh, comes before the wife. The husband comes before the wife. So it is preferred, the scholar says, because the wife also has rights. Remember that we've talked about the, the rights of the wife and she has also rights to sexual pleasure. Yeah, we talked about this. So uh, the scholars say we have to use foreplay to arouse the wives so they can come and then they can also come as, as along with us and maybe even before us. We don't want to leave them wanting. Many of the husbands do this. They are finished. They are done, done with their part. Alhamdulillah, they go away. The wife is left wanting. What about her? She has a right up on this matter upon you. So this is a very important part to start off the act. And you can add to this a nice dinner, for example, roses, bouquet, um, perfume, all these matter. Brush your teeth. <laughs> yeah. Some people are bad smelling and this puts away the, the, the whole uh, objective is gone. So clean your teeth, make sure your teeth are, uh, have a nice smell, your mouth has a nice smell, inshallah. Yeah, so foreplay is something we, we many, many, many times neglect, but this is very, very important. And this is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophet, the leader of, amongst us. Yeah, uh, also there is a dua to be said in the sunnah while entering, while approaching your wife. And the dua is said by both the husband and the wife. What is the dua? Rasulullah has taught us this dua, and many, many of us know this. Bismillahi Allahumma jannab de shaitan wa jannab de shaitan amara zaktana. Bismillahi Allahumma jannab de shaitan wa jannab de shaitan amara zaktana. In the name of Allah, Bismillah is the name of Allah. Allahumma O Allah, jannab de shaitan. Yani protect, uh, protect us, uh, protect us from the shaitan and jannab de shaitan amara zaktana and protect. What you may give us, what, what the risk you may give us, which is a child, inshallah, if there is a child out of that act from shaitan. And this is Bukhari, and Rasulullah said, After this, if Allah has decreed that they will have a child, the shaitan will never be able to harm that child. Never be able to. And who, who also did this, if you remember? The mother of, mother of Maryam, she prayed for this. Uh, for Allah, not this dua specifically, but a similar ayat in the Quran, asking Allah to protect her, uh, what is in her womb, because she thought it was a boy, but it was Maryam, a lady, a girl, sorry. Yeah, uh, And that, that, pers that person's offspring. So even the, her grandson, in this case, Isa, and both of them, these were the only two children who were protected from shaitan at birth. See, and Islam talks about it. We have a hadith for this. And I can send it to you offline if you remind me, inshallah. Uh, when a child is born, all of us know this, even the doctors who are listening will know this. When a child comes out of the womb of a, of a mother, what is the first thing you notice? It cries. It cries. Why does it cry? Why does a child cry? We've been hearing things like, you know, and I, even when I was young, I've been hearing these things. Because the child comes from the comfort of the womb, to a totally new atmosphere which is different to it, it cries. How do you and I know that? When we were children, did we know this? Do we have recollection of this? Or did anybody tell us this? This is why it happens. We are assuming. We are assuming this. But Islam tells us why it is happening. Islam, Alham, Alhamdulillah. Islam has every, an answer to everything. Alhamdulillah. Islam tells us why this is happening. It is because Iblis, Shaitan, is there at every birth and he pricks the child. In another riwayat, he pricks it near the navel. In another riwayat, he stabs it with a knife. But the meaning is similar. To take revenge because he thinks it is because of his, 
this child's father, Adam alayhi salam, that he was thrown out of Jannah. This is why the child cries. Not because it is coming to a different environment. You think Allah doesn't know that? Billah, that the environment inside is different from the environment outside? We assume this because we have no better knowledge. But now that we have knowledge, we believe in this class. Alhamdulillah. This hadith sahih. Whether we understand it or not. How is it possible? There are so many children born, born simultaneously all on the khalas. Allah says this, Alhamdulillah, Samiyana wa ta'ana. We believe and we obey. So there is a dua. And we should memorize this dua if you do not know this. And recite it before approaching the wife. Even the wife should recite it before she is approached upon by her husband. And we know that it is forbidden. And all of know this. It is also in the Quran. To have the act during her cycles. Because she is impure. You can do everything else except the actual act. This is not allowed. This is haram. In uh, her cycles. When she is having the head. Right? And um, also, it is required, mandated rather, to only approach her in her vagina, not from the backside. This is haram. Along with the issue with the head, this is also haram, as most of us already know. Uh, in the time of, uh, we, we remember we took the ayat in Surah Baqarah, where Allah says, meaning of which is, your wives are a tilt for you, and approach your tilt when, on, when or how as you will. So you cannot use this ayat and misinterpret it and say, okay, I also approach it from the back because Allah says, approach it as you will. And what I know, people have told me this, reliable sources, that many Muslims today, they are forcing their wives to do it from the backside. A, this is haram. B, this is an area of dirt and najasa. C, it may have lead to diseases. For it is because these people are, are inundated with the pornography, with the uh, uh, Western uh, way of things. Khalas, the Westerners are animals. They are animals. The Kufar are animals. We are above the animals. We are higher up in the human, uh, what do you call it, in the, in the animal kingdom chain or whatever you call it. Yeah? This is haram, brothers and sisters. And the sister, if this is happening, she should yani, explain to the husband. Take the ayat, take the hadith and explain to him. Jazakallah khair. So this ayat was revealed. Why? Because at that time, when this was revealed in the context, amongst the Jews uh, of Medina, uh, they had this belief or ideology that if you approach uh, the, the woman from the back, uh, the child is born disfigured. Uh, approach from the back, but in the vagina. The child is born disfigured. So Allah, to clarify this, he revealed the ayat saying, approach them as you wish. So you approach them from the front or from the backside, uh, physically I mean, but through the vagina, not from the back passage. The back passage is haram, totally haram. And this, I'm sure, maybe the ones who are listening and others who will listen, inshallah, maybe only 5% of them know this. This is, this, is, this, is, this is a command. That the husband should not pull out of the act until he has satisfied his wife. And scholars, Sheikh Shaykh Al-Albani, Sheikh Jibali, Rahmullah, they say it is haram for him to do that, Allahu Alam, but they categorize it as haram. And if he wants to do it, he has to seek her permission. Subhanallah. You see the beauty of the deen? See, if you follow all of this, we have great pleasure in the, in the bedroom. And inshallah, we love each other more so outside the bedroom. And inshallah, nothing else will happen to this marriage. Inshallah, inshallah, of course, things can still happen. This is the will of Allah as a test. But the point is that in this case, many husbands uh, would take it off once they're finished and the wife is still uh, not even there as yet because we talked about the fact that the husband comes before the wife. And if he wants to do this, the scholars say, Sheikh Al-Bani and Sheikh Jibali, that he has to seek permission. If she says, okay, then he takes it out. Otherwise, no, he keeps it till she also, inshallah, comes. Because this is her right upon the husband. Allahu Akbar. This is her right upon the husband. If you want to do it multiple times in the same night or in the same uh, time, you want to do it multiple times with the wife, you have to make you have to make wudu between the sessions. You have to make it. This, this is obligatory. You can't do it immediately again. You have to go into the hammam, make wudu and come back. Bathing is preferable, inshallah. Ghusl is preferable. But we have a hadith of Rasulullah that um, uh, once he was I forget the narrative. 
and then let me see if I have the narrator with me. Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, it will come inshallah. So, uh, the Rasulullah had this practice that we discussed yesterday or day before, I think. After Asr, he would go and approach all his wives and also some, many times sleep with them. And in the end of it, he would make ghusl. So he said, it is okay to do this in the hadith or also after every session, you can make ghusl. But wudu, you have to. Wudu, you have to. Because sometimes what happens, we live in like a joint family system or, uh, you know, the hammam is outside. Especially for newly married, this is a bit embarrassing, embarrassing sometimes, right? Uh, you know, you have to go to the hammam outside, outside or uh, passing through other passages and rooms where people may see you to make ghusl. Uh, this, uh, yani, at times, it's a bit embarrassing uh, for, for people, of course. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is known. So it is better to make uh, ghusl in the morning if you wish, but at least do wudu. Even if you don't do multiple times, even if you finish once, make wudu and go to sleep. You have to make at least wudu. Why? Because Rasulullah said in another hadith, the one who goes to sleep in this condition, in a condition of janaba, the angels do not come close to him. The angels do not come close to him. And we know another hadith, that one who once goes to sleep reciting ayat al-kursi, Allah deputes an angel to him to guard him the whole night. But if he's in a state of janaba, and he goes to sleep in a state of janaba, the angels will not come near him. So it is, it is a must to make wudu, inshallah. Try to make wudu. If you can do ghusl, alhamdulillah, this is good. But at least before fajr, you have to make ghusl. Because you have to be fajr. And fajr, for fajr, you need uh, to be in a state of tahara. So you have to make ghusl at least before fajr. Uh, but if you are too lazy or you're feeling embarrassed, at least make wudu, uh, if not ghusl, uh, and go to sleep. Because otherwise the angels will not come close to you. Also, many Muslims do not know this. That uh, even if there is no discharge, as long as the private parts meet without a barrier, wudu or ghusl becomes mandatory. Even if there is no discharge. You've lost the state of tahara, you have to make wudu or ghusl. Ghusl actually, sorry, ghusl. Even if, even if the private parts uh, are not, the, the, the male part is not inside the female part, even if they just meet without a barrier, they're touching without a barrier, there is no penetration, you still have to make ghusl. Many Muslims do not know this. You have to make ghusl, brothers and sisters. This is the correct way, inshallah. And this is the way, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yeah, this is another problem. Many Muslims feel or think that they should not show their nakedness to their wives. And they bring all kinds of fabricated hadith, audhu billah, on the name of Rasulullah sallallahu regarding this, which is a lie. Subhanallah, if you don't show your nakedness to your wife, whom will you show it to? Ajib yani. Wallahi, we, we put ajib obstacles in the sunnah and the actual sunnah we don't follow. So let me be clear and explicit. There is absolutely nothing wrong in the husband and the wife sleeping together naked. Seeing each other's nakedness, touching each other's nakedness. This is what it is supposed to be. This is why they were created and this is why they are married. If they don't do it here, where will they do it? With the receptionist? Subhanallah. Ajibiyani. So this is a false misconception. It is not correct. And uh, sorry, going back to this slide. Yeah, when you talked about entering only through the vagina and not doing it through the hive. There is a hadith I forgot to mention. Rasulullah mentioned in the hadith. This is a beautiful hadith to understand. A sahabi came to him, to Rasulullah and he said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, what is uh, mark the words, uh, not the words of the Sahaba, the question. He has said, Ya Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, what is allowed with my wife? What is allowed with my wife? And look at the answer of Rasulullah. He said, Do not approach her during her hayat and do not approach her from the back passage. So Rasulullah did not say, this is allowed, this is allowed, fala allowed, fala allowed, fala allowed, fala allowed, 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 because the question is, what is allowed? What is allowed? That's the question. So the answer is not, fala, 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 this is allowed, this is allowed, this is allowed. No. Rasulullah just mentioned what is not allowed. Meaning which word? Meaning everything else is allowed, inshallah. Khalas. So he said, do not, he, he replied in the negative. 
He said, do not approach her during her hayat, her menses, her cycles, and do not approach her in the back passage. These two are forbidden haram. From the Muharramat, there is a punishment if you do this. If you're doing this, if one is doing this, there is a punishment for him, except if Allah wishes to forgive. That's an important hadith to mention because many people have this, can I do this to my wife? They ask, can I do this? It's, it's all allowed except these two things as per the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, okay. Bathing together. This is sunnah. Wallahi, wallahi, I'm not joking. This is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Aisha. Hadith, many a hadith. Aisha radhiallahu would say, after doing the action, Rasulullah and I would bathe together. Subhanallah. So beautiful. So beautiful. This is, this is how love increases. So they would, they would sit together and have a common, you know, uh, like you call a bucket today or something like that, uh, a container with water. And they would take, uh, they would have one um, uh, mug, if you want to call it that, you know, M-U-G for taking the water out, yeah? So Rasulullah would take one and then she would take one. They would bathe together, exposing themselves together. Their husband and wife, ya khay. Husband and wife can do this, no problem, absolutely. Subhanallah. We don't want to do this with the wives and the husbands, but we look elsewhere and do it elsewhere outside. Zina, zina. And that's okay? Ajeeb. Really ajeeb. So, and, and she said, uh, we, would, we, would, we would fight and race for the mug. And Rasulullah said, oh, Aisha, leave some water for me. Leave some water for me. You see how beautiful the hadith is? This is love. This is how love grows in the hearts. Brothers and sisters, follow Islam correctly to the T. Inshallah, your life will be a better process. Even if you have issues, you will know exactly how to sort them out. As we look at the next section, Inshallah. Which is potential issues. We are like uh, one and a half hours through. So I'm just thinking whether we need to stop or we need to continue. Um, I think maybe we'll stop, inshallah, uh, and, and look at this in the next section, because now uh, this is going into the next issue of potential issues. Uh, let me just mention to you quickly the hadith of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding Iblis. He said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in hadith, Iblis sets up his throne over water every evening. At the end of the day, Iblis, the main, the main shaitan, the main uh, demon, if you want to call it that, the one who was thrown out of Jannah, the one who uh, whispered to our father, Adam a.s. Iblis. He sets up his throne over water every evening. Where? Allahu Alam. Somewhere on the earth. And all the jinn, the bad jinn, all the bad jinn, they come and they report to him what they did. All the bad deeds. He's taking report. It's, it's like reports, senior management reporting, as they call it, yeah? Top management reporting, senior management reporting, dashboard reporting, what have you, yeah? So reporting to the manager, who's, who's Iblis. So the hadith says, one, one jinn, jinni stands up and says, uh, I did this and this and this. So Iblis says, you did nothing, sit down. And then another stands up and says, I did this and this and this. Falan, falan, falan. Iblis says, you did nothing, sit down. Till one genie stands up and says, I, I did not leave this couple, the husband and wife. I did not leave this couple until I separated them. Until I made divorce between them. What does Iblis reply? He says, you're my man. Now you have done something. You're my man. Come and sit next to me. And he calls him and makes him sit on his right side. Giving him honor and elevating his status. Why? Because he succeeded in splitting this couple. He succeeded in planting discord. He succeeded in planting hatred. He succeeded in, in making talaq between the husband and wife. He didn't leave them. He kept whispering to them this and this and this and this and that. Kept, kept triggering their fights, escalating their fights till he separated them. And in the eyes of Iblis, his manager, he's the best of the jinn. What do we understand from this hadith, brothers and sisters? A, that for Iblis, separating a family, separating a husband and wife is foremost in priority. This is priority number one 
priority number A. Khalas, nothing beyond this. Anything else you do is, is nothing, seamless. Tomorrow he will repent. Khalas. This, khalas, this is now, this is something. Why? Why? Iblis knows that once he dis breaks up the husband from wife, the, the family is gone, the children are gone, the nucleus of the society, the core of the society is gone. How will you build an Islamic society? How will you, khilaf, how will you, have, how will you have khilafat when there is no family itself? This is the basic building foundation, the basic building block of an Islamic society. And that is why that pleases him the most. That is priority number one for him. So we need to understand, brothers and sisters, that when we have fights in the house, and we will see all of this, inshallah, in the next section, that it is the husband, the wife, and shaitan. So instead of fighting between us, we should fight shaitan. Because he's there. He's there. Uh, uh, stroking the flames as they say he is there kindling the fire he is there igniting the fires he is there putting more whispers he is there recounting the past oh she did she said this and this and this she, he said this then then and then he brings back all the past memories to you because he wants to break you up so bear in mind that you are going to fight the shaitan and not fight yourselves there is no fight there is no point fighting between yourselves you have to fight shaitan so in this section, what I'm going to do in the next section, inshallah, as an introduction, just uh, now, uh, I'm going to look at marital problems from four perspectives. But I don't think really there's a fifth perspective. If there is, if there is, let me know, inshallah, we will try to include it. But I think all the marriage problems we have in our societies today, in the families today, boil down to these four perspectives. They can be either between the spouses, between the husband and wife, issues resulting between, the, between these two, or due to issues between these two, Issues uh, arising because of matters between the wife and her in-laws. It could, could be mother-in-law, it could be sister-in-law. Issues because of this. The third one, which is at the bottom, is issues because of the husband and his in-laws. So the husband and, and the father-in-law, husband and mother-in-law, husband and brother-in-law, primarily, yeah? <laughs> okay. And issues, lastly, arising in the family because of the children. The raising of the children, the upbringing, the education matters, all these kind of issues. So we're going to inshallah look at all of these inshallah starting next uh, section or next session, sorry. And so I don't know why they call them in-laws. Uh, it's probably at some point in time law comes into play. Madri, well, I, I don't know why they call them in-laws. Uh, I don't think there's any other English word for it. But anyway, we'll stick with in-laws for now. If somebody knows the answer, please let me know inshallah. I've been trying to find the answer. So we're going to look at marital problems from these four perspectives and how to solve them using Islam. We are still in the during marriage section. We are still in the during marriage section. After we finish all of this, these four perspectives, which probably will take one or two classes, and then we'll look at after marriage. Talaq, uh, divorce, uh, khul, uh, fask, and so on and so forth. Barakallah fikum. So inshallah, we will stop with this uh, and look at any questions that you may have. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. Another question I had for all of you is, uh, when to do the next section, our next session, because now I think uh, people are back to work largely. Uh, of course, we'll have a session next Juma, same time, 4.15, inshallah, next Juma, 4.15, uh, we'll have a session. But before that, during the week, if you wish, we can have one more section or session or two more sessions. But uh, I was looking at, I don't know, like, you know, maybe 8.45 p.m. KC time on uh, Monday, if that's okay for you. I know it'd be a bit late in the subcontinent. I'm not sure if this is feasible for them. Um, if not, let me know on the group, on the Telegram group. Uh, if not, we will do only one on Yom Al-Jumah. Uh, but I want to do one in the middle uh, during the weekdays because at least we keep in touch. We don't forget what we're talking about because one week is a long gap and we want to help the, the brothers and sisters and their families, right? And I hope all of you are working on the Excel sheets. Maybe some of you have finished the sheets. And I hope your, uh, your performances are good. If not, please look at the scores, which are like three, two, and one, and work at those from your sides. Yeah? Barakla fikum. Type. Um, questions. How to instill love amongst the spouses? Some tips. Uh, we will discuss this, brother, in the next section about disputes. But uh, see, when, when, uh, briefly, when, when a husband and wife fulfill their rights, which we talked about already, the love has already started, inshallah. Any, you're, if, if you're a brother asking this question, when you come home, what is it that you want the most? You want a clean house, 
you want a nice looking wife, uh, you know, showered and, and looking pretty for you. You want uh, a nice hot cooked meal. And your life is made. Your day is made. Yes or no? Honestly, yes or no? Yes. This will increase the love. What does a wife want? I'm just giving you some examples. We'll look at more, inshallah, during the dispute uh, section uh, or, or potential issue section. What does the wife want the most? If the sisters are listening, if this is sister's this question, what does a wife want, want the most? She wants her husband to be kind to her. She wants to retain her husband as much as possible. She doesn't care about the whole wide world. As long as the husband loves her, as long as the husband is hers, her day is made. If the husband walks into the house with a bouquet of roses, see, for us men, honestly, even for me, today, till today, I have no idea why women like roses or why women like flowers generally and jewelry. It doesn't, that itself shows us, that itself shows us that men and women are, women are different. We are not equal. But for a sister, flowers, bouquets, roses, red roses, pink roses, jewelry, diamonds, uh, platinum, it pleases her a lot. A day is made. But for us, it doesn't make sense. That's, that, itself, that itself shows you we are different. We are different. We are created differently. So for a wife, the husband walks into the house with a smile on, her, on his face, with a bouquet of roses. Khalas. That's all she wants. And he speaks to her nicely. And he, how many of us enter our houses and tell our wives, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wallahi, how many of us? This is sunnah. This is sunnah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would use the miswak. You know miswak, the brush, the stick we talked about earlier, siwak. He would make miswak before opening the door to his home. He would make miswak before entering his house. Why? Because he wanted a nice breath. Because he's been outside. He's been outside, maybe he ate something. He's been, maybe there's dirt in his mouth. He doesn't want his wife to get a bad smell. This is love. This is love. Love is not running around a tree and singing a song. This is love. How many of us use miswak before entering the house? This is sunnah. He would, and then after entering, he will say, Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How many of us greet our wives with the, with the peace and blessings of Allah upon them? It's a dua. We don't do this. We enter the house shouting and banging and cursing. And How do you expect love to be there? So it works both ways. We have to keep in mind the rights. Each, each person's, the husband has to note the rights. The wife has to note the rights. And work and trying to please the husband. And work and try to please the wife. Yes, the meal is there. The husband is happy with a nice uh, hot meal. He eats from it. Do you compliment the wife? Even if it is not good, do you compliment her? Maybe she missed something. She's had a lot of tough day at work. Even, even at home. Even at work, you have tough days. You, you, you make mess of the project reports, you make mess of the presentations, and the manager shouts, shouts at you. She's also a human being. Maybe she had a tough day at, at, at home. The kids were uh, unduly or abnormally uh, naughty today. And she missed something in the food. I tell Jazakillah, the food is fantastic today. What will it take for you to say this? And when she tastes the food, and she realizes that something was missing, and still in spite of that, my husband complimented me. Don't you think she will love you even more? This is love. This is how you build love in the small things. When you're at work in the office, you're having a hard day at the office. How many of us pick up the phone and talk to our wives and say, Asalaamu Alaikum, how are you? How was your day today so far? Did you pray Duha? Did you pray Salatul Duha? How are the kids? Halas. Jazakallah, Asalaamu Alaikum, keep the phone down. Two minutes, two minutes of your time. That's all it will take. But for the wife, it means a lot. For the wife, it means the whole world that the husband is calling her up and inquiring about her. When you walk into the house, how many of you ask your wives, how was your day? The wife asks the husband, how was your day? Did, did the husband also ask their wives, how was your day today? What did you do? Did you have a nice day, inshallah? Where is Allah's being name being mentioned? Where is the barakah? Where is the dua coming? It's not there. This is what causes the love, brothers and sisters, husband and wives who are listening. This is what causes the love amongst the spouses. And there can be many, many more type tips, but these are some which come to mind. And inshallah, as we go along and we discuss potential issues, also I will talk about uh, those um, inshallah tips, inshallah. Alimran 34 or 35. 
I think the brother is talking about the ayat you mentioned. I think it was 34 if you mentioned, if I remember right. Inshallah, I will check, brother. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad. Wa alaikum, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu Can you give the hadith for the infant crying when it comes out of the shaitan's act? Of pricking? Yes, Inshallah. I will send you the hadith on the group about the pricking of shaitan on every newborn. And this hadith is narrated by many scholars, many uh, books of hadith. So inshallah, I will pick you the Sahih Hadith and send it to you, inshallah. Barakla Fik. Also, the Dua Hadith when the couples approach each other. Yes, inshallah, I should have put this on the slide. My mistake because this is an important Dua. But inshallah, I will send it on the group, the Telegram group, uh, about the Dua which uh, the couple should say before uh, entering or before approaching uh, uh, each other. Barakallahu Fikum. Inshallah, I will, I will send you the Hadith and the Dua. Bismillah. Type. Uh, both of them should make wudu while approaching multiple. Yes, yes. Jazakumullah khair. And sorry, I forgot to clarify that. We said um, when you when you have multiple sessions or even after one session, uh, uh, both should make wudu. The husband and the wife. Yes, the husband and the wife are now in a state of janaba, and both should make wudu before repeating the act, if you wish, or uh, at least before sleeping, because the angels will not um, approach. Right. So and and wudu is 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 is, is good. Inshallah. And what effect it has? The scholars are given various reasons. Allahu alam. But we, for us, it is enough that you know the hadith is there and we take it. So yes, it is applicable uh, because they are in Janaba. They do not sleep with wudu because the angels will not approach them. So they have to make wudu. Uh, could we do wudu before sleeping every day and angel will take care of the sheikh? Yes, this is sunnah. Uh, the question is, can we make wudu before sleeping? Yes, this is the sunnah of Rasulullah. It is highly mustahab to go to sleep in a state of wudu. Type your question. Your next question will be then, because we know sleep will break the wudu. One of the, one of the acts which break wudu is falling asleep or unconsciousness or deep sleep. So now you're sleeping, your wudu is broken. Yes, alhamdulillah, it's broken. But the, the, the hadith is what? Make wudu before sleeping. And this is sunnah. And if you go in, a, if you sleep, sleep in a state of tahara, this is good. But the angel coming to take care of you, this is not related to the wudu. This is related to the ayat al-kursi. The Rasulullah says, if you recite ayat al-kursi, the famous hadith of Abu Huraira, if you remember, Abu Huraira was guarding uh, the food the Baitul Mal and, and Shaitan came to take from it and he caught him repeatedly and finally Shaitan told him this that if you see Risat Atul Kursi and sleep uh, Shaitan will not be able to hurt you the whole night and he went to Rasulullah Rasulullah informed him that this is true the one who spoke to you is a liar because he's Shaitan but what he spoke is the truth so from this we know that Allah deputes an angel to take care of you if you recite Atul Kursi uh, for the whole night it's not related to the wudu, but wudu, wudu, wudu is, yes, wudu is, uh, sleeping wudu is an act of sunnah. It's highly mustahab. Barakallahu feek. Allahu alam. Uh, kindly share the hadith about the discussion of Iblis and the jinn who separates the couples. Okay, inshallah, I will also share this hadith with you about the, um, I think I have it on the slides. No, I missed it from the slides. Inshallah, I will, I will also put it in the slides next section, uh, next uh, session. Uh, and I will share it with you also in the group about the hadith of the of Shaitan Iblis taking the reports from the uh, Shayateen. Barakallahu feek, Allahu alam. Uh, Sheikh, can the sisters um, work in schools as a teacher, particularly when she accompanies her children for their security and well-being? Uh, the issue is not, brother. The brother's question is, can can the sisters work in schools as a teacher, particularly when she accompanies her children? For the security and well-being, it is not about accompaniment. It is about what she is being exposed to, uh, accompanying them and taking care of the children, and their security is secondary. That's an outcome of, of the travel to school. But what about herself? So, uh, like we said, it is best for her to stick to her house. This is the sunnah. This is what Allah has commanded in the Quran. If she wants to work, if she wants to work, there should be a necessity for it, because the husband is supposed to take care of the wife. We saw this already. The husband is the provider and maintainer. Huh? We, we looked at this ayat, uh, Surat Nisa, ayat 34. Uh, okay, oh, that, I think that's what, that, that's what the brother is mentioning. I think it's Surat Nisa, brother, not Surat Al-Imran. Let me check again, but I think it's Surat Nisa, ayat number 34. Uh, anyway, so the, 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 the hukum is clear. The job role is clear. The only place scholars give an allowance or a flexibility or, or a permissibility is when there is a necessity. There is a necessity for her to work. The husband is dead. There is no income. Uh, not, don't tell me the husband's income is not enough. This is not a valid excuse. The husband's income is not enough is not a valid excuse. The husband's income will never be enough. This is how we are created. 
the husband's income will never be enough. Learn to live, be contented. Wallahi, be contented with what we have. Do not spread your feet more than the chadar, as they say. Learn to manage within your husband's income. Jazakallah khair. This is what Allah is providing for you. Khalas. Why do you want to go and do make haram to get more money? Ajeeb. So the only place the scholars allow this and make it permissible is if there is no income, absolutely. It's not sufficient or not, not there at all. Nobody to take care of the sister. Then she can go and work. Not only, not only as a teacher, this teacher is an example, but she can go out, but there are conditions. She has to go in her complete abaya, uh, hijab, uh, Islamic attire, covering her face. Covering her face. This is wajib, mandatory. At work, there is no mixing with non-Maharam men. At work, she doesn't have to remove, uh, you know, she doesn't have to um, uh, destroy the hijab. No non-Maharam men. No shaking hands. No flirting. No making jokes. No uh, unnecessary talking with non-Maharam men. And if she, if she has to, it should be behind her face cover and to the limit only. And if she's teaching children, depends on the children. If there are boys in, in 12th grade, no. This haram. Because now she's seeing boys in 12th grade, then they, then they sing, sing her. And 12th grade is khalas, they're adults. So you do not do all these haram just to get an extra real in the house or an extra dollar in the house. And the husband is also responsible for this because he sent her out. And, 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 I forgot to mention, sorry. And she should have taken care of the rights of her husband and her children upon her. Once all this is taken care of, then she can go out if, she, if, if there is a requirement. But otherwise, no. Otherwise, no. Security and well-being of children, the husband can take and drop them. No problem, inshallah. Well, I see, if the intention, I'm giving, I'm giving a personal experience. If the intention is right, if you want to please Allah, don't look for ways to work around the ayat and work around the hadith. Look to please Allah. Allah will make it easy for you. Uh, in my, one of my last jobs when I was here, uh, it required a lot of travel. It's my personal experience. I'm, I'm sharing with you. I shouldn't be actually ideally, but it's not from, from a perspective of showing off. Allah knows best. It's more from uh, a lesson learned. And, and, and the fact that if you sincerely do something for the, for the sake of Allah, Allah will take care of you. My earlier job here, many years back, it required a lot of travel. And I was, I had only my wife with me and my eldest son and maybe, yes, my second daughter, uh, first daughter as well. She was young. But nobody else. I didn't have relations in this city where, I'm living, where I was living. And because my intention was, alhamdulillah, that only I should take my wife out anywhere. Otherwise, she should not go out. I never, wallah, I believe, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. This is the will of Allah and the fadl of Allah and his mercy, mercy upon us. I, it was approximately, I think, six years, or six plus years. Not once, not once, in spite of me, if me, in spite of me traveling uh, twice or thrice in a month, maybe sometimes two, three days in a week, I'm not there. Not once there was there a need for my wife to go out. Even when she fell sick, when there was a need to go to the hospital, I was, alhamdulillah, present. And I could take off time from work. Alhamdulillah. So you see, when you do think things seeking the pleasure of Allah, but the, in, the in, intention is sincere. You want to follow the command of Allah in the Quran. You want to follow the command of Allah in the Hadith. Allah makes matters easy. Wallahu alam barakallahu feek. Jazakumullah khairan. Taib. Weekdays are possible, but take class for one hour shake. Taib. So the brother says weekday is okay for him, inshallah. Uh, but only for one hour, yes, jazakumullah khairan. Noted, inshallah. So if we, if we do a class, on Yom al or Tulata, we will try to keep it, stick it to one hour. Jazakumullah khairan. A point noted, inshallah. Um, the shaken manners of the bed on first slide. Last point, is there any reference for this? First slide, last point. Let me go back. Sorry, first slide, last point. Yes, inshallah, I will send you also the reference for this, inshallah. Barakallah fiqh. What I remember from this is that it is the saying of the scholars based on their understanding of the references. But inshallah, I will check and send you this as well, based on the uh, right of the wife on the husband that she also requires uh, to fulfill her sexual desires. See, for a wife, uh, it is not sufficient to just do it. When we say she needs to fulfill her sexual desires, if, if a husband does it with her and pulls out before she comes, she has not yet fulfilled her desire. Her right is not yet fulfilled. 
You see the point? Brother who asked the question. Her right is not yet fulfilled. She is still left wanting. Her right, what is the right on, 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 on the husband? We looked at this. Um, yes. Sexual enjoyment. She needs to enjoy that. Not you enjoy it or the husband enjoy it and then you pull it out and she's left wanting. So she has not yet enjoyed it. So based on this, the scholars say he cannot pull out until she has enjoyed and reached a climax. Paraklafik. And then shall I will also look into the but this is what I remember of uh, reading up on, on this point and I will also inshallah uh, send you the daril. Uh, we will stop with this. Zakmullah Khairan, Subhanakala wa bihamdik, Ashahadu Allah illa ant, astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk, wa akhri dawa and alhamdulillah bil alameen. Okay, I heard there is a hadith on burying the body at the earliest time. Uh, Salman took. Yes, yes, okay. I'm th I think he's talking about the, 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 the hadith of Um Sulaim, radiallahu anha, that she had the body. Allahu alam, uh, this hadith is there, yes, uh, but we do not know when this hadith was revealed. Uh, was it after this or before this event? Allahu alam. Uh, if it was before, obviously uh, she felt that the right of the husband is more than burying the body immediately. Uh, and it was only at the period of the night. It was not that the body was kept uh, for two, three days. No, it was only one night. Uh, the boy had just died uh, when the, before the before Abu Talha came back home. Allahu alam. Inshallah, I will also check this. But Allahu alam, we need to check when the hadith was revealed, the, the, the timeline, uh, if it was before or after this event. And if it was before, Umar Sulaim obviously thought, and Rasulullah Sallam agreed with this because he did not reprimand her for it. That why did not bury the body earlier? He didn't say this. Only he only made dua for Allah to bless their action that night, and and the body was buried in the morning. So. Uh, one one night is, is perfectly okay, inshallah. Uh, but yes, the bodies have to be buried as early as possible uh, once the necessary arrangements have been done. We do not wait for people to come from here and from there, uh, leaving the body in cold storage, leaving the body waiting. Islam talks about burying as soon as possible. Barakallahu uh, feekum. We will see you, inshallah, one of the days in the week, inshallah. And we'll try to keep it only for one hour. I will send you the invitation uh, separately. Um, are you going to send the Excel sheet on Telegram? Brother, the Excel sheet is already sent on Telegram. Uh, if you're on the group, which I created new, Islam for us hyphen, um, Islam for us hyphen. This is the Telegram group. I think I've added you, brother. Just check it again. Uh, this is the group. Uh, the Excel sheet is already there. Uh, so you can just go back and look at the sheets. There's one file for the husband, one file for the wife. Uh, do not cheat, do not share uh, notes until you finish your own sheets and then if you wish you can share uh, and see how well you have done and if your if your spouse agrees with your scoring it's about just about improvement basically like we said right and shall i see you uh, next section for the potential issues between the husband and wife uh assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh